Good afternoon. My name is Aaron Kelshiker, and I'm a volunteer on CFA UK's Inclusion and Diversity Committee. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to CFA UK's virtual event series, Inclusion at the Heart of ESG, Accelerating Change Through Social and Governance Factors. With the urgency of climate change and biodiversity loss, ESG investing in recent years is generally headlined with respect to the environment. However, to properly address ESG, we need to consider a wider responsible investing agenda. In line with this, we've seen a heightened focus on the S and G aspects within ESG and their clear linkage to the global diversity, equity and inclusion agenda across society. Recent examples include the EU's proposed social taxonomy, alongside its green taxonomy, as well as the UK Financial Reporting Council's revamp of its stewardship code, which saw the initial number of signatories fall from over 300 to around 125. In the UK, we've also come to the end of the five-year government-led Parker Review, which documented that across the company boards of FTSE 250 companies, 59% did not meet the target of having at least one director of colour on their board. Greater interconnectedness and interdependence has highlighted key areas which need to be addressed so as to benefit all stakeholders. In this event series, across the next three Thursdays, leading up to the week of International Women's Day on the 8th of March, we've organized a series of topical panels and key conversations with a host of leading thinkers and expert speakers focused on diversity, equity and inclusion and the S and G in ESG. For today's sessions, we are starting with a panel conversation, enabling a just transition, together with Andrew Parry, Nick Robbins, Maria Nazareva Doyle, and Victor Himes. Following that, we have a fireside chat, moving the needle on inclusion, together with Virginie Messenev and Jane Stiles, and that will be hosted by Juliet Bullock at 2 p.m. Following a break at 3 p.m., Will Goodhart will lead a fireside chat with Gina Miller. Our final panel for the day will start at 3.50 and will be on embedding diversity, equity and inclusion within an organization, focusing on CFA Institute's new diversity, equity and inclusion code, led by Sarah Maynard, together with Dominique Cherry and Kion Holmes. Rasha Sibai will then share closing remarks and more information on the upcoming sessions. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. And with that, I'll turn it over to Andrew for the first session, Enabling a Just Transition. Many thanks, Aaron. Uh, it always helps if you can unmute your microphone. I'm delighted to be, to be here today to moderate this panel. Um, a very esteemed group of uh, panelists um, and delightful, yeah, delighted to be able to kick off this, uh, uh, this ESG event for the CFA Society. I'm a member, like Aaron, of the CFA UK Society's uh, Investment and uh, Diversity group, I'm head of investment at Joe Hambro, and also been heavily involved in the sustainable and impact space over many years now. Um, really, the just transition is, I think, at the heart of the sustainable investing movement and has a particular resonance, as you'll hear from my panelists today, on I inclusion and diversity. I think what we want to explore today with the panelists is what opportunities the just transition actually represents and more importantly practical ways of implementing it at the firm level as well as investing in it. Now, without further ado because you're not here to, uh, today to listen to me uh, it's, it's to get uh, to listen to my panelists I should like to introduce them so firstly um, Professor Nick Robbins one of the founders of the just transition uh, Nick leads the Sustainable Finance Institute, uh, uh, the Grantham in uh, Sustainable Finance Initiative at the Grantham Institute, and is a leading authority on all things sustainable investing. And is, is the, is, it's a delight to have him here today. Uh, next up is Mar Maria Nazarova Doyle, a very well known figure in the sustainable investing movement, and Maria's head of pension investments and responsible investment at Scottish Widow. So, welcome. Uh, Maria, it's good to be on a panel again with you. Uh, next up is Sylvia Solomon, um, an old colleague. Uh, so it's great to be back talking with Sylvia again. Uh, she is Director of Business Development and ESG at Equitile Investments, a firm that's actually dedicated to promoting a healthier financial system. 
And finally, my good friend and mentor, Victor Himes, uh, founder and CEO of Legato Capital Management, a, uh, a, an emerging manager investment firm in San Francisco and a member of think tank, the Brookings Institute. So thank you all for uh, joining me today. And um, I'm, I'm going to start actually by asking Nick to frame really what the just transition is and uh, why it's so important for the the future of sustainable investing. So over to you, Nick. Well, thanks so much, Andrew. And it's uh, great to be with such uh, fantastic leaders, investment leaders on this on this panel on such a, a tough day in, in, in the world with the, the events going on in, in, in Ukraine. Um, so firstly, I think this this series is so important and timely about placing inclusion at the heart of ESG. And I think really the just transition is all about placing inclusion at the heart of particularly climate action. Um, I think we see the just transition as a critical enabling factor for successful efforts to deliver a resilient net zero economy. And investors really have a key role to play. Um, what I've seen is certainly in the last five years, the just transition has moved from really being something of a marginal concern to being quite central. And at the COP26 Glasgow Summit, we saw a range of governments, businesses and finance commitments uh, being taken. Uh, and I think for all of us this year, 2022, is going to be the year to put these commitments into practice, uh, not least at this time of yet another fossil fuel price crisis. So, Andrew, you asked me, sort of, what is the just transition? Uh, it's, a, it's a strategy that was included in the Paris Agreement in 2015 to ensure that as we take vital climate action, we consider the positive and the negative implications primarily for workers, but also for communities and consumers. And essentially, that we join up between crises of ecological decline and rising inequality. Um, so the just transition essentially means minimizing the social risks of transition so that workers and communities are not left behind. Uh, we don't have stranded workers as well as stranded assets. But also I think there's this other dimension, the second dimension, which means just transition means maximizing the social opportunities of the transition. So that so the new green economy has more and better jobs, where rights at work and human rights are respected, where the green jobs of the future are more diverse and where place-based needs are met. So we now have a range of governments, the EU, South Africa, the US, the UK, many, many others now recognizing the just transition as a policy priority. I suppose the question for us today is why is it an issue really for investors? Um, back in 2018, uh, the LSE, where I'm from, with Harvard and the Principles of Responsible Investment and the International Trade Union Confederation published the first guide for investors to just transition. And since then, we've seen commitments from hundreds of investors with tens of trillions in assets, the inclusion of just transition in major initiatives such as Climate Action 100 Plus, which many of you on this call will be part of, as well as the uh, Glasgow Finance Alliance for Net Zero. Here in the UK, where I'm based, uh, the LSE also hosts the Finance and the Just Transition Alliance. So three reasons why investors should really be thinking about this. First, it's, it's the right thing to do, and it's about applying long-standing investor commitments to labor standards and human rights to this disruptive process of climate action. Secondly, it's also a necessary thing to do. We need to build public trust and support for climate action. It's a way of minimizing risks to the transition when people feel that their livelihoods could be harmed. And third, I think, and this is, this is really distinctive for investors, it's the smart thing for investors to do because it builds the human and social cap cap capital in the companies that you hold and investing and enables them to be successful in the race to net zero. So I think those seem to me to be three compelling reasons. And then I suppose investors need to think about what they can, can do. Um, the main thing about Just Transition is about joining up the environmental and social dimensions of the, the energy transition, the nature transition, and integrating the human dimension across classic investor approaches. So that means recognizing Just Transition in climate strategy, in transition plans, particularly for asset owners, as they signal down the investor chain. Secondly, shareholder engagement, bondholder engagement is a really effective way to ensure that the companies you hold are taking effective approaches to just transition. One example in the UK, it was investor engagement that really helped trigger the power utility SSE to develop one of the most comprehensive just transition plans. And this is not a one-off. This is shareholder engagement, just transition is really picking up. 
Then there's capital allocation. How can we uh, develop uh, capital allocation strategies which are tailored to the just transition? I think this is particularly for real assets, particularly for place-based assets, and also, for example, uh, fixed income. The UK's sovereign bond, green sovereign bond, has a particular commitment to measure the social co-benefits of its green spending. Uh, and then finally, investors obviously also deeply engaged in, in the policy processes, signaling to governments what they need on climate change, carbon pricing, etc. also need to signal the importance of, of just transition. It's governments who do skills policy. It's governments who do industrial policy, regional policy, and so on. And they need, governments need to know from investors that just transition is an important part of their overall policy package. And so we're in 2022. We're in a really tough time, a time of huge turbulence in the global economy, in global politics. Um, and, and so some of the things I would think investors probably should be focusing on as, as we look ahead. The big game in town for climate action at the moment is transition plans, both for real economy companies and financial institutions. These need to have just transition at the heart of it. Uh, and we can discuss how that could happen. Then there is the critical role of participation in the just transition. Just transition is about outcomes, but also processes, how people are involved in decision making. How are workers and communities and others at the table when decisions are made? As one trade union representative told me, nothing about us without us. And finally, I think we need to focus on emerging economies where the just transition has to be seen in a really bigger con context of sustainable development. But it's urgent. Uh, investors are already at taking action, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from the others on the panel about their experience in taking this forward. Back to you, Andrew. Thank you, Nick. And I think that's a very eloquent uh, exposition of why the just transition is at the heart of the sustainable investment movement and a very critically part of the system change that is embedded in, in, in the thinking and our role as key actors, as investors in, in that change. So I'd like to get, just quickly get uh, the perspective from each of the panelists uh, on the just transition before we move into into questions. So maybe I could start with you, Sylvia. What's what's your uh, thought on the just transition? Yeah, no, thank you uh, very much, um, Andrew, and also thank you, um, CFA UK and Aaron, for organising this and inviting us along. Um, Nick actually described very well and um, some parts of the social dimension. Um, in the just transition, which is actually behind the big changes in the way our economy works in order to achieve climate neutrality. Um, at Equitile, um, we invest in large cap global equities with a focus on corporate quality, where companies exist within that wider ecosystem, encompassing their sort of employees, suppliers, customers, and society at large. Um, we do believe that the most resilient and successful companies are ones in which good leadership considers the creation of broader prosperity for all of these respective stakeholders with a constructive attitude towards shareholders and financiers. However, as we all know, governance doesn't actually occur in a, back in a social vacuum. Um, the effectiveness of a board is shaped by the shared history of interactions of independent minds actually contesting ideas. Um, and we find that you know, boards comprised of people with the same background and career profession tend to think you know, the same way are more likely to find it more difficult to see how the world is changing um, with regards to that move towards net zero and uh, respond appropriately. Um, likewise, in our industry, diverse investment teams can actually help their firms shift more quickly to new investor demands. Um, as we know, in the long run, no company can prosper without high quality governance and healthy corporate culture, which is inclusive. It must treat all of its employees fairly and without discrimination. It must conduct its business legally and it must compensate its management and staff appropriately, thereby fostering an alignment of interests with shareholders. Um, unethical or neglectful behaviour can be devastating to shareholders. Um, and we find um, not just to shareholders, but also to other capital providers. Uh, so therefore, in a just transition, the financial management of the firm must be, must be conducted in a responsible manner. Um, allowing the firm to invest for future growth while surviving, you know, inevitable sort of business setbacks going through the transition. Um, companies where management endanger both the capital of their shareholders and the jobs of their employees uh, by using risky financial manoeuvres or opaque decision-making processes are simply unsustainable. Um, and as investors, we are encouraging our investee companies to focus less on knee-jerk reaction um, to headline news and reward efforts that promote sustained change. 
Right. Thank you, Sylvia. And I, I picked up on that sort of word resilience and where all those factors you, you've talked about lead to that ability and compound long-term yeah, financial returns, which I think is a key element of this discussion. Uh, Maria, your perspective on the just transition. Thank you. Um, I couldn't agree more with the previous speakers as just transition as a concept is absolutely vital. So the effects of climate change and of decarbonizing the economy, they will fall disproportionately on those in poverty or insecure work, uh, on those people in carbon intensive industries, those in fossil fuel dependent countries. Uh, and there'll be huge difference, differences between the global north and the global south. Uh, and that means that it risks exacerbating gender, racial, age, and all other inequalities, creating not just stranded assets, but as Nick has said, you know, strand, stranded regions, stranded people um, across the world. And women are a majority of the world's poor, and they often um, depend on farming for their livelihoods. And these livelihoods are now absolutely being destroyed with unseasonable temperatures and other severe weather effects. So women are much more likely than men to be displaced by the effects of climate change, uh, particularly of the physical effects of climate change, and they constitute 80% of this affected group. But when it comes to decision-making around solutions to the climate crisis globally, women are severely underrepresented, uh, and this is often due to them not having the universal right and or easy access to education and family planning. Uh, and I found this fascinating um, statistic sort of from Project Drawdown that has estimated uh, that having better access to both education and family planning can save or sequester 85 billion tonnes of greenhouse gases over the next 30 years, which is actually quite significant if you stop and think that total global emissions are around 35 billion tonnes a year. Uh, so it's a really significant contribution from women, from including women into this um, insofar as we, we possibly can. And I'm sure we can all agree that those who are affected the most should have a seat at the table where decisions are made uh, about how to address their futures. You know, we're talking about the future, so they should be represented. Again, Nick touched brilliantly upon that. And it's not just women, it's communities of color and indigenous people. They're at the forefront of climate change issues and they're affected by floods, fires, hurricanes, you know, you name it. But at the same time, they're completely in the background uh, and underrepresented when it comes to devising those solutions. Um, so managing the net zero transition in a just way can help reduce inequalities and increase representation. So it's definitely a worthwhile thing to do. Right, thanks, Maria. And I think there's a good link there with one of Nick's sort of concepts of stranded assets in the fossil fuel world from carbon tracker with a stranded community, stranded social assets. And I think that is growing up in a in a coal mining village myself, uh, I know that that can last decades, not just a, a short period of time. Um, and finally, Victor, do you have, uh, good to get your, your perspective on the just transition. Yes, uh, thank you very much, first of all, to the UK CFA Society and Andrew for your invitation. Uh, uh, I echo what has already been said. Um, at Legato, uh, we spend a lot of time kind of actualizing much of this inclusion piece as we are taking uh, assets, identifying both women and people of color that are really largely unrepresented in the asset management world, funding those people, and most importantly, walking alongside them as they evolve. So it's not just funding and running away, it's funding and bringing a, a, a tremendous expertise alongside them and experience. And so, uh, what I've learned in the 20 years of doing this at Legato is inclusion is a muscle that needs some work. <laughs> and, so, and so that's, I think, a great, a, a great segue into what we're going to talk about today. Um, and I, 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 I love Nick's opening remarks. I really focused in on two and three, uh, which were the minimizing risk and the necessity of all of this. And also, it's the smart thing to do. And I was thinking, you know, big picture, we can only succeed at this together in the long term. That's an important piece. And I say that because it will be essential for us to find uh, organizations, institutions that are on the margin today that need to come into the circle. And we'll have to help them come into that circle. Uh, the, the global challenge will be, and a number of the speakers have raised this issue, the global challenge is, the manifestation of these ideas will be different in different regions of the world. The issues will be different and we'll have to parse through those and bring uh, importance and significance to those in those local areas. 
um, I start with the premise that we all have something to contribute. So now we're going to have to adjust the aperture of our lens to be able to see where that contribution can come from. And finally, uh, and I think the, the reality of all of this is it will require transformation on all of our parts. This is not something you export to a department or you move to a corner. You as a board will have to transform. Your teams will have to transform. The way they look at things in the world will have to transform. And the good news is there's a huge benefit. And this goes to Nick's third point about being smart. You will be ahead of the pack. You will do better. Uh, and so that is the reward that you'll get. So very exciting topic. Wonderful to be with you today. Thank, thank you, Victor. And I, I've always thought of sustainability as not a as current state of being, but very much that journey, that transition into a future uh, aspiration state of being. Um, I'm going to move to some questions, and I'll start with Maria and, and Victor. You know, as I was listening to Nick talk about the gen just transition, I was, I was sort of struck by the scale and the complexity. So, so what do you think the strategic challenges are for the just transition from an investor perspective and also for the stakeholders who engage with them? Maria, maybe you could start. Yeah, happy to. Um, this is a very interesting question and it's so multifaceted. So there's a long list of challenges. So I'll just touch upon a few um, and I'll just zoom in on a few of those that are relevant to us as pension investors. Um, so firstly, there's lack of understanding in the pensions industry of the concept of the just transition. So while the environmental issues and particularly the net zero transition are well trodden you know, and well understood and accepted as highly relevant in the pensions industry, there's a lot less understanding uh, from pension fund fiduciaries and beneficiaries of the just transition concept, meaning it is less likely uh, that we're going to see pension funds engaging with companies on the social aspects of the low carbon transition. And as a result, uh, there are few opportunities for collaboration, you know, for those of us who really want to do it. Um, so there, there are fewer collaborative investor engagement opportunities in this particular area. And conversely, pension funds and their members are taking on the journey to see the just aspect of the transition as being intrinsic to the transition itself and understand that focusing on the S aspects of climate change will contribute to the resilience of their portfolios in the long run. It will be an absolute win-win. Um, so secondly, talking about stakeholders on the investee company side, um, there is a lot to say about entrenched interests still. Unfortunately, through our engagement with corporates, we sometimes observe that some companies may have um, decision makers that try to hold on to that traditional way. Um, for example, a number of oil and gas companies, there has been strong resistance to transitioning in the first place, now, never mind transition in a just way. Uh, and the more delay there is to the net zero transition, the more likely that the transition will be unjust or in other words, um, if it's forced through the inevitable policy response route uh, in a disorderly fashion, that will be a total disaster, I think. Um, and uh, let me make another point um, about the cost of investment. So quite close to, <laughs> to our suspension funds, particularly in defined contribution space. So cost of investing in projects that have more alignment with the long term termism and um, incorporate the just transition element are usually higher than a plain vanilla approach. And I'm thinking here things like impact funds uh, that are actively managed or private markets investments where these projects can be supported directly uh, through capital flows. And this higher cost in comparison to market cap index trackers, um, in my view, is fully justified given the types of investments and also justified in the context of achieving better overall outcomes for pension savers um, that they would get from, you know, from such allocations in their portfolios, in particular in defined contribution pensions. Um, however, we have been witnessing a race to the bottom on fees over the last several years in the UK, and I'm concerned that it will be hard to come back from that. Um, and this is a real issue, as the, in the UK now we have uh, nearly £1 trillion pounds in pensions, in DC pensions. Um, so it's a lot of capital that is currently just simply following the market index, and but can actually be put to better use by allowing finance to flow into more sustainable areas leading to better outcomes for the individual savers, but also for the planet. And um, well, um, hopefully that gives you a flavor of some of the issues we'll come across as pension investors uh, who are trying to incorporate the just transition elements into portfolios and into our stewardship. Okay, now that, that perspective is very helpful. And, and Victor, um, what, what's your view? Well, for investors and stakeholders, um, I think the challenge is, there, there's an equal challenge for both. Um, one is that, Profit has been our, our, our orientation. 
And in a, in a way that can blind us because we see the, the building of profit in our current world and we'll need to take a journey to a new structure of profit in the future that, inc that has inclusion at its foundation. And so uh, it'll, it, it'll require us to be on this journey and that will be a challenge for both investors and for stakeholders. That being said, I think about this whole idea of language and education as it folds into this. Uh, in the last 20 years that I've been involved in the business I'm in, I've had to unlearn a lot of the traditional things I was taught about risk because they really aren't true, <laughs> frankly. And they're just a construct that the majority created so that things could remain in the same structure they're in. And so, and so when I talk about the journey, it's an interesting journey because some of the journey involves us testing some of these things we've been educated collectively to believe and really reviewing them and saying, what are the issues? A great example of this is I sat with a client once and they said, you know, our risk with dealing with a smaller manager with smaller AUM is that, goodness, what happens if they go out of business? And I said, well, what is your risk? What is your real risk there? And they said, well, we're worried about losing our money. I said, well, your money's all domiciled in your custody bank, right, that you control. So even if the manager disappeared today, your money would be safe. And they thought, they looked at me and they said, you know, I never thought of it that way, <laughs> you know. And so that's an example of how the language and the things we've learned have to kind of be sent back the other way if we're to move forward. And really, I think the, 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 the important piece of all of this is experience and education will be key. So we're going to need to partner with people who can help us on this journey. It is not something that you could take a department and say, you did this the same way for 50 years. And I think Sylvia was touching on this. You've done this the same way for 50 years. Hey, we're going to change what we do. Go into the other room and do the new thing today. It's not that simple. It really does take some experience. And so we'll have to align ourselves with groups, individuals, spend a lot of time talking about best practices that are being implemented in reality at other institutions if we don't have that expertise internally to succeed. I'll stop there because I know there are lots of interesting topics. Yeah, that's very, very really fascinating from, uh, from both you and Maria. And I do think there's an, a need for us to begin to rethink about different forms of inputs into our decisions that aren't just about financial capital and different ways of thinking around, say, education and health, not as costs, but as actually investments in the future or natural capital as actually having a value beyond exploitation. So some really interesting ideas uh, emerging there. Um, in terms of um, the, the motives for engaging the, the, the just transition, what do you think re resonates with different investors? And, you know, actually, importantly, is this a, a great opportunity to collaborate across st stakeholders? Maybe, maybe, Sylvia, we could start start with you and then bring Victor back in. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you. And um, actually, I'll touch on, uh, continue almost partly in terms of why, in terms of engagement, um, things that when Maria sort of referenced the pension funds and, and also uh, profits that Victor talked about. Investors actually have an interest in avoiding conflicts during the just transition as part of their fiduciary duty. Um, the way in which, for example, renewable energy projects are developed and implemented matters for both local communities as well as investors. Um, there's actually been a rise in reports of renewable energy projects negatively affecting the communities where they operate. Um, and this actually sometimes causes operational delays, legal costs and reputational risks which are likely to translate into diminished financial returns for investors, as well as increased operational and capital expenditure. Um, so we view voting and engagement are sort of co-integrated as part of an overarching approach to effective stewardship. Um, we've adopted an ESG-themed voting policy, which helps commit us to more sort of supporting more ESG resolutions. Um, and as many of, I think, the attendees here today um, as active fiduciary investors, if you operate under the scope of the Shareholders' Rights Directive uh, 2, um, considering a purposeful sort of two-way dialogue with investee companies on material ESG concerns is actually quite a helpful tool to enable all of us to achieve specific and targeted objectives, um, which should, in the long run, enhance our clients' um, long-term investment values. 
Um, and then added to that, you know, the just transition concept actually links to 14 of the 17 sustainable development goals, uh, explicitly, explicitly sort of drawing upon uh, climate action, um, reducing inequalities, uh, decent work and economic growth, gender equality, and affordable and clean energy. Um, we recognize that many of these sort of large issues are systemic, and hence they're more suited to coordinated cross-sectoral sort of action. And so through collective dialogue, we have a critical role to play in translating just transition ambitions into action. Um, so we find that um, it's been a bit easier being a smaller firm to establish sort of robust partnerships with relevant and interested stakeholders um, with that aim of influencing public policy um, and diffusing um, industry best practice to build these sustainable financial markets. So, for example, I mean, it's very easy actually to become supportive of the uh, task force on climate related financial disclosures actually costs nothing um probably a bit a little bit more to become signatory to the pri itself or you know having you know membership with um the alternative investment management association um and you know even as individuals you could be committed to you know the human rights watch for example um and you know with the goal to facilitate this implementation of change within you know companies as they move towards net zero so I find that as an active member of some of these organizations, we collectively engage with other shareholders to provide that leadership in industry um, initiatives, such as advocacy on public uh, policy issues. And you, we're able to better participate um, in market level uh, dialogue and seminars like today uh, to contribute to the you know, development of themes, policies, and practices that can support sustainable business practices and shareholder returns, of course. Um, and last but not least, I'd like to say that even a commitment to CFA UK and our parent, um, the Institute, um, where activities include, you know, contributions towards regulatory engagement, educational programmes and the provision of sound practice guides um, is also helpful um, in terms of engaging and creating sort of, you know, skills workshops for students and for local communities, in addition to sort of university colleges. So there are many ways I think um, we can all sort of draw together here and it is actually quite imperative as Victor has also Nick said um, before. Thanks Sylvia, uh, yeah, that, that sort of in, central importance of continuous education and continually adaptive yeah. learning is so important. Victor, you know, what's your perspective on the collaboration uh, element sure. needed? Well, it, it's it's there are, there are uh, I'll, I'll come at it in a different way because I think Sylvia has so well covered um, really some of the positive points. And uh, one of the things I'm, you know, when you think about the risk and the challenges, we're experiencing some of them right now as a result of COVID-19 and the great uh, resignation, at least in North America. Uh, this is critical because there's a talent drain going on, you know, as we, as we speak. And so uh, organizations and institutions are going to be challenged with just what does their internal environment look like? What is their internal environment? What, what are the benefits of their internal environment? And how is that transforming to the betterment, which can only be enhanced through inclusion uh, and a diversity being brought to bear? Because this is top of mind. As you go down in age, it becomes more important. All the statistics are, share, are showing us. And so it's critically important. The, the cautionary note I throw out is, and, and this is from direct experience with many of the environmental organizations whose boards I've sat on in the past, we will go often and say, we've got a great investment idea that will help us promote inclusion and diversity. And then let's go ask some of our colleagues at other organizations. And the answer we get back will be on the surface, a very good answer. But then we'll dig deeper because we're pretty diligent. <laughs> we'll dig deeper and we'll say, well, wait a minute. This might not actually be solving the problem that we're trying to solve. And so the challenge for us all is going to be to first of all, set a vision of what success looks like. I really think this is important and very few people do this. I say, when you start an initiative, uh, many come to me and say, we'd like to have a DEI community, committee on our board. And I always start with, what do you want the outcome to be? And they look at me with a blank face because they thought the outcome was to form a DEI committee. I said, no, that's not the outcome. What is the purpose? What is what does success look like? Once you've ad identified and defined it, then you now have a template that you're going to apply to everything that you do. And if you do not have that template, you're just following people around and you find that you, you're nowhere close to solving a problem. 
you're literally just a cog in a wheel doing what your neighbor is doing. And that will not help us. It will not help us in climate change policy. It will not help us in DEI or inclusion policies. So what my cautionary note is that we have to set what is the objective? What do we seek? And that becomes in and of itself a tremendous challenge for many institutions strategically because it's not the way we tend to think about things. We tend to just say, someone else told us we have to do this, let's go do it. And we do it, <laughs> okay? And we don't think, what is it we're trying to achieve? And is this really the best way? Critically important is because this issue manifests itself so differently in different regions of the world, that is yet another reason why you can't just go to your neighbor and say, how do I solve this problem? It's different in North America than it is in Europe, than it is in Asia, than it is in the emerging markets. And so critically important that we do that tough work up front. Thank you, Victor. That's a yeah, very sage advice, and you know, and and it's a really important question to say what outcomes we we actually want to achieve. It's often focused too much on the methodology, not actually on the outcomes that we need to be delivered. Nick, I'd like to bring you sort of back in here because I think we've heard a lot about the benefits uh, of the just transition and how it can be implemented in various different ways. But do you think there are any sort of potential? conflicts that we, that need to be managed. You know, here I'm sort of thinking about the boundary between investor responsibility and perhaps that of wider civil society, you know, are we straying into politics? And maybe Maria can then come in and talk about how that fits with fiduciary purpose at a pension fund. Yeah, no, it's really good listening to Victor's, a really good, really good comments. I mean, we, I think we've heard already that the the transition to a zero uh, resilient economy is, is, is absolutely necessary. It's going to be great, but there are going to, there are going to be um, disruptions uh, along the way, and th therefore there will be um, tensions and conflicts, uh, potentially tensions between uh, company management and workers and communities. Let's let's think about some of those uh, fossil fuel assets and communities around the world, which are going to where these these sort of long-standing sources of income and so on are, are going to wind down and, and disappear in the coming decades. So, so this is this is not a uh, a, a walk in the park in in, in many uh, cases. Um, so, I think one of the one of the tools is going to be potential uh, conflict uh, resolution tools, uh, ways of. Uh, new ways of decision making uh, and, and and so on, and and on the politics point, I think clearly the just transition as a particular concept has come out of the trade union movement. Having an estate, environmental justice is used as a, as, a, as a phrase as well. But I think investors here are in a safe position because the just transition is in the Paris Agreement. It is in the um, uh, it, it is it is in the uh, the agreements coming out of Glasgow. It's in the Glasgow Finance Alliance for Net Zero. Just transition is best practice in terms of transition plans and so on. So I, so I think it's now accepted as, as, as a phrase which is um, weighted towards ensuring the interests of people are, are included in the transition. But I think, it, I think it's, not, it's not pure politics, I would, I, would, I would say. But I think this skill in recognizing and anticipating potential conflicts and, and clashes. I, I think, Maria, you were talking about this. Anticipating those, getting ahead of time, because if we don't, then some of the shocks could be much greater. You mentioned in these, you know, just transition being embedded in the Paris Agreement, we've got the COP26. Uh, and one observation I would make is that a, a realization that becomes then a mechanism for legal enforcement of these obligations, as we've seen with the Shell case in in, in the Netherlands, you know, it, they used a lot of that about the climate policy, and then that is going to be a precedent for you know, holding people to account who being committed to them. Uh, and Maria, you know, from the, just that fiduciary perspective, with oil soaring above a hundred dollars a barrel today, um, how do you handle that sort of? conversation with your your pension funds about the, the potential challenges yeah i mean nick covered this brilliantly but I'll just probably have a point or two to add so for us it's often about kind of the conflict is between investment and so disinvestment and engagement 
Um, so as an investor, there's often this conflict in consideration. Um, when we think about companies, you know, that we want to behave as responsibly, you know, as possible, but then we're also conscious like of the implications of divestment. So, um, so if a company you know doesn't behave as responsibly as we would like it to, you know, there's the big consequences to divestment. So if we are doing, um, if all we're doing is either selling our stake further on or forcing companies to offload the unpalatable staff from their balance sheets into potential what could be unscrupulous hands and away from the scrutiny of public markets, then the problem is still there. Uh, it's just not in our portfolio, but it's still there in the real world. So it's a balancing act. Um, but where possible, investors should be stewarding a sustainable exit uh, from these sort of brown, dark brown um, parts of their businesses and including implications for local communities where jobs might be fully dependent on that particular pollutant operation. And when we engage with our NVST companies, um, this is both with the, goal, with the goal of driving positive change in the real world and enhancing the value of our portfolio. But if that engagement fails at some point uh, or is just painfully slow, uh, that creates additional risks to our investments. And at some point, we just have to make a decision about divestment as ultimately our duties to our pension customers. So this could be quite a difficult decision to make. And you can see this kind of conflict, you know, so what, what do we do? And uh, yeah, and we do divest uh, sometimes. Um, and in terms of politics versus policy, um, well, Scottish Wood has worked really hard to enhance the value of our customers' retirement savings. Uh, and we're not concerned with politics. But of course, we regularly take part in government roundtables, consultations, and so on, where we believe there is a potential impact on our customers' retirement savings. So being involved in government activity is pretty much unavoidable for us, to be honest. But I think it's important to distinguish politics from policy. So contributing to policy development in order to improve the UK pension system is the absolutely right thing to do for pension funds and pension providers. Um, so, so I think that that distinction is quite important there. Thank you for that, Maria. It's, you know, I think there has to be a plurality of different approaches. You know, there is no one approach, you know, not divestment, it's not just engagement, it has to be what's appropriate. And of course, active managers, it's not divestment, it's often not including. And actually, the, the power of not owning is sometimes un, un, understated if you're, if you're shunned because you're not doing the right thing. That's, a, that's another, uh, another element. I'd sort of like to turn it sort of more inwards now. Oh, I've been plunged in darkness by uh, <laughs> energy efficient light, lighting here. Um, but don't let that distract us from the question. But uh, I'll bring back uh, Sylvia and Nick back in here. And this is about more the internal. And, you know, increasingly it's a requirement for us to turn the light on ourselves and to think about the just transition through our own internal approach to inclusion and diversity. And I, I wonder, Sylvia, you had some thoughts on that. Um, yes, thanks. Um, I was going to say, it, well, historically, uh, DE and I was often thought of as some philanthropic sort of duty, and I'm really thankful personally um, that society is now woken up to the fact that merely care caring about it um, serves no purpose, and so it has become more deliberate. And I think that that's actually quite important because if you have a DE and I approach that is just sort of compliance or programmatic sort of focused. Uh, characterised typically by policy tick box and grassroots exercises, you typically result in limited progress um, beyond sort of mere awareness. Um, so real cultural change, embracing transformation and inclusiveness that sort of Victor alluded to before, only starts to become more substantial when leadership buy-in appears and is further enhanced by fully integrating DE&I into the organisation, including sort of staff behaviour um, and, and business processes. Um, we might find it more helpful to view DEI both as an investment opportunity that drives value beyond compliance and a necessary mechanism that aligns sort of economic performance with social progress. Um, so in practice, we can start by just making a just transition um, strategy central to all of our investment strategies by setting up processes and procedures that allocates capital efficiently. Um, we can use investor action that we've described before to challenge companies on their just transition strategy, incorporating DE&I, ensuring that remuneration is actually tied to strategic future objectives and operational targets across the organization. Um, I found quite helpful appraisal systems um, that could be drawn from frameworks such as the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, which everybody refers to as SASB, and even TCFD, which actually expend considerable resources developing and setting comprehensive global standards 
Uh, so bolstering due diligence of data um, disclosures into fast growing sectors, monitoring and reassessing the prioritization of long term social inclusion and resilience uh, through education, reskilling and retraining for employees is also essential. Um, and this is especially vital in the areas that are more, oh, well, most reliant on greenhouse gas intensive industries. So that as we de decarbonize the economy, this doesn't come at a human cost. Um, so the strategy to drive DEI should const you know, constantly and consistently be measured and monitored. I think much like financial metrics that steer the business, because ultimately they will have an Im impact on the bottom line. So it's not enough, I think, just to assess disclosures, but actually to ensure um, that you have a, a process or a system in place to actually see what's, you know, what, what the development is sustained over the long term. Thank you, Sylvia. And, and Nick, and what do you think, from your perspective, we should be doing more internally uh, on the just transition? Well, well, I think so. It's very well set out, actually, how just transition needs to become sort of syst systematically included. And I think actually framing the, the discussion today in terms of um, diversity, equality, and inclusion is a very helpful way because I think it's just transition is a very good way of bringing this this all uh, to life. Maybe if I could touch on two elements to, to supplement what Sylvia said. I think one is actually this will be a real uh, testing ground. I think for uh, investment managers with um, diverse teams and, and boards because actually a lot of the just transition will be having insights and understandings about how this particular transition the climate transition is going to play out and so in having uh, diverse teams is going to enable I think uh, fund managers and, and asset owners also to be able to better understand maybe some of the the issues that are below the surface that haven't yet uh, been realized and so on so I think this is going to be strong there and then Perhaps picking up a uh, point Victor earlier made, I think trying to understand where um, metrics can be uh, developed here for just transition to measure what what outcomes, and I think that will be uh, around particularly thinking about some sort of absolute uh, factors in terms of respect to human rights and so on, particularly driving down issues around uh, fuel poverty, access to energy, um, but also then seeing maybe particular inequality factors, whether by gender, race, age, income, uh, location, and so on, also those um, improving over time. And I think also recognizing that some of the things which are quite important about a just transition perhaps can't be, uh, well, perhaps can't be, certainly can't be approached in a tick box way, which I think sometimes brings sort of ESG into disrepute. It does require quite sophisticated dialogue with, with firms and communities. Thank you. Um, in, in the next question, I'm actually trying to um, weave in a question from the, the audience, so um, from Stephen Beer. So, Stephen, apologies if I butcher your, your question, but um, really it's about trying to think about what innovations and models we need in responsible investing if we are to incorporate the just transition. I'm thinking we hear about particular, you know, investment goals. Do we need new vehicles? But particularly how this then sits with the production of financial returns. You know, we've all seen there's been criticism of Dan on and more recently Unilever on the implementation of sustainability. And today, some dramatic market movements on, on, on geopolitics. So maybe I could bring Maria and Nick back in on, on this one again. Yep. Very happy. Um, so um, there are a number of things that can be done. And one of the most effective methods of responsible ownership is, of course, collective engagement. So collective engagement, uh, vehicles like Climate Action 100 Plus have shown that this is very effective as a model for engagement and for bringing about this real world change. And furthering this with robust benchmarking assessments that embed just transition as a key indicator to measure transition progress will be absolutely key. So we can go back to metrics and how we measure it and what you know what we see as a gold standard. Um, we will likely see an increase in these sort of um, sorts of initiatives as well. So I'm looking forward uh, to seeing Human Rights 100 plus or Social Action 100 plus being established, for example, um, as awareness of the impact of social factors is growing among investors. Um, so we're kind of starting to move on from just E, uh, you know, and a lot more in to, into the S of ESG. But moving on from engagement to investment, just transition creates uh, a lot of opportunities for impact investment. And that's not um, simply concessionary, but where a good return can also be achieved alongside just transition related goals. 
And I'm starting to see developing interest in areas that help create new green jobs, regional place-based investing, merchant market microfinancing, women empowerment projects, and so on. And you know, we're only one of the investors that are looking into these areas, but we're not the only ones. Um, and it's also interesting that you mentioned Danone and Unilever. Uh, from the pensions point of view, we're long-term investors. So we believe that over that long term, the companies that best embed ESG considerations into their business practices will be most viable, most successful. So Danone and Unilever have been criticized for over-advertising sustainability, with the claim being that um, this has dampened their financial performance and is a distraction from their main business. But it's important to say that there's little evidence to actually back this up. So the short term poor financial performance could be due to any number of reasons. And you just mentioned geopolitical situations. You know? So um, from our point of view, we welcome companies that take sustainability seriously, providing that obviously they can back up their marketing slogans. But to be honest with you, the, um, the latest wave of ESG denialism has been so strong that we felt like enough is enough. And we got together with other pension funds all to the tune of 675 billion pounds of worth of assets and we wrote an open letter in the FT a couple of weeks ago which you may have seen so we believe that long-term value is most reliably generated by companies that are led with clear sense of purpose that guides their strategy and that informs their values so stakeholder capitalism is a powerful form of capitalism that unleashes mutually beneficial relationships and it's hard to see where this would apply better than it does to our just transition debate um, so, yeah, going back to Danone and Unilever, uh, they need to keep doing what they do and more companies need to be like them. Thank you. And, and Nick, is this more about how we report the impact of, uh, that we're achieving or, you know, is it, is there, a, you know, can there be a challenge with for the production of financial returns or is it just a, a you know, a, a time horizon problem that we, we, we suffer from? I think there is an issue, and I think there is potentially a, a structural issue that um, sort of the financial systems we've developed over the last 20, 30 years are, are very good at thinking about uh, global opportunities and, and large global corporates. But I think often we've seen, regardless of climate change, we have seen a concern about underinvested communities around, around, around the world. So I think uh, Maria touched on it, but I think there's a real need uh, for investment strategies. Maybe, again, it's going to be in private markets, real assets, which are more place-based, uh, which are thinking about investing in particular communities and responding to their needs. Maybe thinking about also different types of investment uh, models, maybe community-owned or uh, models. Uh, and that might involve different types of structures, particularly maybe uh, working with development banks and, and 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 so on. So I think that is I think that's the, the sort of the, the real need um, that, uh, that we're seeing, as well as the sort of I suppose long term engagement and holding of, uh, of the large uh, corporates. That more place based specific um, investment strategies. Yes, I think the place based ones do resonate with a lot of pension investors. It, it is something that you can see a very tangible local me that's a fascinating area it's one of the areas of impact that has opened up a marketplace it's not just how we perceive current investments it's about actually enabling impact orientated business models and new opportunities uh, and another question that's come in and i'm going to get uh, maybe sylvia to comment on this is about the different and with nick as well because his work in india the, the difference in how you actually implement the just transition in your investment process in developed versus developed markets. Yes, no, thank you uh, for that. Um, I know that we've only got, I think, about a, a minute or so um, left in our session. Um, so um, I, I, I will sort of keep it a little bit brief. Um, but um, one of the key aspects that we look at um, is, is really um, trying to understand uh, the actual impact of financing um, through the value chain um, of, of some of these companies because that supply chain as well as the, you know, the whole value chain is quite important if you think about uh, the differences between developed and um, emerging markets. Um, I, 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 I'm not sure whether we should continue this Nick into the next session um, in terms of the Q&A bit that people are allowed to stay on because I just know sorry, we've run out of time almost. Yes, yeah, so time management's never been my strong point, so I apologise <laughs> for that. I was so wrapped up in the conversation. Sorry, yeah, I, so I took, sort of got 15 or 13 seconds left now. 
Well, uh, we, we can, uh, well, it, on the basis that we're probably going to have the guillotine for down on so I'm actually going to you know, thank my uh, my panellists. Uh, it's been an absolutely riveting conversation, and, and I think it does show the depth of topics. It, it, it's showing, actually, in many ways, how environmental, social, and governance issues, the just transition, are just sort of intimately embedded in our day jobs of, of being good investors. Pains to say it's not about a prescriptive uh, methodological approach, but it's about gaining the insights in how we actually manage a world in transition, a world in flux. How do we actually navigate our clients, our members, the individuals at the end of the value chain in investing to actually you know, produce the financial returns over the long term that will you know, meet their savings and meet their uh, their retirement needs and it is a very much a journey and a journey of a lot of complexity and a lot of uncertainty and it's very much a, a, an adaptive approach and that's why that learning at all levels is so it's so so imp important you know so the heart of sustainability is adaptation to a changing system not a static backward looking uh, viewpoint. Um, given that we, I think we, we um, I've covered the questions from the audience at the moment, but just to stand very quickly, you know, I've, I've sort of given my view, but any quick sort of uh, summary comments, 30 seconds from each of you on where we, yeah, where we are, Victor. Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, I have something I want to throw out because there have been so many data providers <laughs> and we, we run a process internally at Legato called introspection where we look at ourselves and say, what are the mistakes we've made? And that's the way we have a system of internal continuous improvement. And here's an example of what worries me. One company says the diversity number five years ago was 10% for whatever that means. The diversity number today is 12%. Another company says my diversity number was 2%. And today after five years, it's 4%, which is the better company. And it's inconclusive. But most people would answer that question and say, one's better. And what we would say is, you need more data and it's different data. So here's what I would throw out. Company one has 90% turnover in its diverse population. Company two has 10% diverse uh, turnover, which tells you there's a toxic work environment at company one that you would never see if you didn't know that turnover number. So this is how data and the absence of data can get you in trouble. And so, and then from there, for our investors, you have huge financial implications with 90% turnover. So that's a drag on the profits of the company. So you can show how these problematic issues can manifest themselves inside the company. So beware of data that doesn't really tell you what you need to know. <laughs> and thank you. Yeah. And if I may add to that, uh, what we found is that um, it is much easier to build from bottom up our own sort of appraisal systems because actually in terms of your proprietary data, I think sometimes that can be underestimated because the way in which your investment philosophy develops also impacts the way in which um, you will, um, I suppose, calibrate your outcomes. Um, and lastly, just in, sort of in summary, I just think the asset management industry actually does play a very key role in helping individuals achieve their savings and life goals. And yet DE&I therein doesn't actually reflect the demographic in broader society. So as an industry, we could start by understanding the critical role we play in influencing sort of behavior and changing perceptions. Uh, so that, you know, investors with the right mindset alongside a system, systematic sort of approach can reflect those different viewpoints and um, backgrounds if we really do, don't just sort of focus on the D, which is what Victor kind of alludes to when you talk about the percentages of the turnover, but the E and the I, I think, are, are very important. <laughs>